This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome everyone to another episode of Literary Treks, your dedicated Star Trek books and comics show here on the Trek FM network. I'm just one of your hosts, Dan Gunther, and joining me as he does every week is the redoubtable, wonderful, amazing, and not from the mirror universe, Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how's it going today? Oh, you know, I was going to Yeah, I've got a little bit of a beard, and I forgot I was going to shave it this morning to make it a goatee (laughs) for the (laughs) Mirror Universe, and I forgot to do that. I'll have to do that before I do live from the edge. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) Awesome. Well, we've got a bit of news this week before we jump into our feature. We've got a book to judge by its cover. We've got a new comic series to announce. And a new comic that's just been released that we're going to review. So let's start with what is going to sadly be, I think, one of the few new cover reveals this year. So we we need to savor these when we get them because the pocketbook schedule is still very thin at the moment. But we did recently just get the cover for Architects of Infinity, which is Kirsten Beyer's newest Star Trek Voyager novel coming on March 27th, 2018. And of course, if you buy from bookstores, you might get it a little earlier than that. But basically, we've got this new cover, purples and pinks. We've got a nebula and the USS Voyager and what I assume is the USS Vesta firing phasers and torpedoes and uh, looking really cool, basically. (laughs) What do you think of this cover? I was boots? wondering what that ship might have been. And if it is the Vesta, it, it's a little more, it, it's closer to you. It's a little more prominent. Voyager's just a little further back. But I love the cover because it's seeing a different ship that we are not used to seeing very often, especially on a book cover, along with Voyager. And I, like you said, those colors, the purples and the blues, I just, this is actually probably one of, my most favorite covers. I just, I, I, I've said this before about covers sometimes where it's like, I'd want a poster of this. This is definitely one I would want a poster of. Yeah, I agree completely. This would, you know, every once in a while you get those prints that are the book covers without the titles and, and that sort of thing. This one, I'm right there with you. I would love to have up on my wall for sure. Just gorgeous. Yeah. And you know, it says New York times bestselling author, Kirsten Beyer, I I was kind of wondering when this book would come out if it would actually say on the cover that she's part of Discovery. Yeah, New York Times best-selling author and oh, what would it say? And um, Star Trek Discovery staff writer, writer staff for writer? Okay. Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty cool because, of course, part of the reason we're getting this novel this year is. Kirsten Beyer has been uh, a little bit behind on her schedule for getting this book out because of her work on Star Trek Discovery. So, you know, good to finally get it and uh, good that we're kind of getting it in this drought period of Star Trek books. So, you know, not only is it uh, 
coming in this period where we don't have a lot of Trek books, but it's one of my absolute favorite series that we're getting too from one of my absolute favorite writers. So that's very cool. Yeah, I didn't look it up. It's when the last Voyager novel came out, but it's been over a year. I mean, I, it's been a while. It's, I think it's when I was like a guest on the show. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Or no, I don't even think yeah, that. No, I, <laughs> I don't know. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, there were two big delays with this book. So uh, I was looking back at my year in review that I do on my book review website. And I was, you know, at the end of 2016 saying how much I'm looking forward to this book because it's one of the announced ones for 2017. And uh, yeah, now it's going to be a few months into 2018 before we actually get it. So. Yep. Well, hopefully she'll come on the show to talk about it. She wants to, but, you know, her schedule's busy. So um, I think we'll be able to work it out. Definitely. Fingers crossed. Well, we do also have the back cover blurb, which uh, I'll read here as well. And it sounds really cool. As the Federation Starship Voyager continues to lead the full circle fleet in its exploration of the Delta Quadrant, Admiral Catherine Janeway remains concerned about the Krenim Imperium and its ability to rewrite time to suit its whims. At Captain Chakotay's suggestion, however, she orders the fleet to focus its attention on a unique planet in a binary system, where a new element has been discovered. Several biospheres exist on this otherwise uninhabitable world, each containing different atmospheres and features that argue other sentient beings once resided on the surface. Janeway hopes that digging into an old-fashioned scientific mystery will lift the crew's morale, but she soon realizes that the secrets buried on this world may be part of a much larger puzzle— one that points to the existence of a species whose power to reshape the galaxy might dwarf that of the Krenim. Meanwhile, Lieutenants Nancy Conlon and Harry Kim continue to struggle with the choices related to Conlon's degenerative condition. Full Circle's medical staff discovers a potential solution, but complications will force a fellow officer to confront her people's troubled past and her own future in ways she never imagined. I'm looking forward to it. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Me too. I feel like I might have to, if not reread the novel that took place before this, at least maybe listen to our podcast about it because I am, I, it's been so long that, you know, there's a lot of these plot points that I don't remember. I do remember them dealing with the Krenum and finding the kind of time capsule from the alternate Voyager that went through the year of hell. But the the Nancy Conlon thing, I have to admit, I don't remember a lot about. I remember some to... of it, but you're right. I can't remember mm. all the details about it. I remember them dealing with it and her having some kind of illness or something going on. Um, but yeah, I, so I just looked it up and I think this is right. Uh, Pocket Full of Lies was the last book and that was in January right. of 2016. So uh, as of this recording... That was two years ago. So by the time the other one comes out, it'll be more than two years. And yeah, that was before I've ever made an appearance on Literary Trek. So yeah, I feel like I have to go back and at least just kind of quick do a quick scan through that book to kind of catch up t- just to mm-hmm. remember. Yeah, it might not be a bad idea for sure. Um, so speaking of Kirsten Beyer, she's, of course, as we mentioned, a writer on Star Trek Discovery. And she's actually shepherding, of course, the Star Trek Discovery novels from the writer's room, as well as the comic book series. And we just got an announcement uh, at the time of this recording that there's a new Star Trek Discovery comic series coming. So this one looks really, really cool. It's called Star Trek Discovery Succession. And it, of course, will tie in directly with the events in the second half of the hit series first season. So this is really cool. We got this kind of little description about it. Succession will be co-written by Mike Johnson, who has a long history of writing Trek comics, and Kirsten Beyer, who is on the Discovery writing staff. The two, of course, previously collaborated on the first Discovery comic series, and we'll be talking about issue two of that series right away here. And this is the part that really caught my eye. Each issue will feature a Ships of the Line cover by renowned comic artist Declan Shalvey and colorist Jordi Belair. Uh, And that will give us our first look at Discovery's new ships. I am a huge sucker for Ships of the Line and what I like to call starship porn. (laughs) (laughs) I've got the Ships of the Line calendar behind me right now and... 
this makes me really excited. That's very I'm cool. excited too because I made a comment at one point early on on Live from the Edge that I feel like there's all those ships, especially in the first two episodes of the Battle of the Binary Stars. And I said, I never felt like it was really getting a chance to really get a good look at them and take them in. And and I feel like this gives us a chance to kind of look at these new ships in, in greater detail and without it just being a quick, like, two seconds flyby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I know Eagle Moss kind of released their renders of a bunch of them when they were talking about the new uh, Eagle Moss um, Star Trek Discovery Starships collection. And I have to tell you, I was, you know, pouring over every little detail of those because for me, especially the new Federation ships that we see, those are so cool. You know, we've got like a foreign celled stargazer type looking ship and a bunch of others. And, ah, man, I can't wait to see this. Yeah, I like to see them all like lined up on your shelf. <laughs> yeah that oh man those are a lot of money <laughs> exactly well you know the thing also about this series uh the fact that it's directly with it's tied directly with the events from the second half of season one well the second half is in the mirror universe so i'm assuming mm-hmm. this these issues will be playing in the mirror universe or maybe whatever after effect there is that you know Maybe they leave the universe or whatever. I don't know. But I wonder, I would like to see somehow, and maybe not in these issues, but in something else, like in the next Mirror Broken series, there's a tie between that mm. and this Discovery Mirror Universe series. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. That would be very and there's cool. And there's like a uh, pin now you can get that's from the Mirror Broken. I forgot to mention that to you. Oh, the 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 Terran Empire from the next generation yeah, pin, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I've seen, I saw somebody online wearing it. That's the first I saw it. Somebody took a picture of themselves. It looks really Yeah, and cool. I compared that to what's in the Mere Broken comic, and it's identical. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm wondering with this particular series, because the Discovery series that's on right now is kind of the prequel to, to Kuvma and his story. I'm wondering, especially with that title, Succession, I wonder if this might be setting up the mirror universe for what we see in discovery. Like maybe it's kind of the prequel talking about, this is all just guessing. I have no idea, but maybe um, emperor Philippa Giorgio and, and her regime, um, maybe a little prequel story with regards to that. I don't know. That's a good point. I mean, just because this is tied directly with the events of the second half of the first season and it's in the mirror universe doesn't mean it has anything really to do with the mirror universe. It's maybe things that we've That's learned true. about the Tyler Voke situation and such. And this is a comic that's uh, diving into more of that, like a prequel. <gasps> Maybe it's the adventures of Captain Killy <laughs> in our universe on the mirror discovery. <laughs> that would be a fun one. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> well, speaking of star trek discovery comics we've got one to review today we've teased it already but let's take a look at it so we've got star trek discovery number two the second issue in the light of Kalis miniseries and to start out with i want to point out that the variant cover that we get for this one of the variant covers is done by trek fm's own aaron harvey And if you get a chance to see this cover, it's really cool. It's kind of this stylized image of Takuvma with this really cool pattern behind him and a batleth from the the Star Trek Discovery style in front of him. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous cover. I think uh, think he really outdid himself here. So congrats to Aaron Harvey on just a gorgeous cover. Yeah, it is a gorgeous cover and I saw he posted on Facebook. It's now um it's a retailer incentive cover and so I think what he said is if a retailer a comic book shop for every 10 issues they order then one of these incentive covers show up. So I guess if they ordered, you know, 100 copies, there would be 10 of these. So that's not like it's something that you're rarely going to find available. If you go into your comic book store, you would probably want to ask to see if it's somewhere in the back, if it's not on the shelves or something. So, yeah, like like we said, one of those incentive covers that, you know, it's 
it's something you'll have to hunt for. And uh, not, that's not to say the regular covers aren't gorgeous, too. They're very cool. There's a few different uh, versions. But, uh, man, if I got the chance, I'd really want to get this Aaron Harvey one personally. And if Aaron <laughs> Harvey is listening, maybe he'll go, oh, Dan really wants this cover really bad. Maybe I'll send him one. <laughs> I didn't say that. Just for Okay, the record, well, then I'll take one, Aaron. Um, <laughs> well, if you're giving them out. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's dive into the actual comic. So when we left the story earlier, uh, Takuvma had left for Boreth, which is the Klingon moon where Kales is supposedly supposed to return someday and study and Takuvma is studying with the monks there and, and learning the ways of, of Kales He's undergoing these trials that the new initiates, I guess, have to go through. And he's proving very tenacious and passing all of these trials. And he has a vision of light, which the monks say, you know, there's no real prophecies about that. But, you know, let's explore that, like continue to to work on that. We can't dismiss your vision. It's seems to be something important. So, and as he's studying, he's going through all these trials and succeeding. And, uh, I have to say during this winter survival challenge, they have to go through, I saw a lot more Klingon, butt than I was expecting to see in this story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan, I did not expect to hear you say that, but yes, we get to, I don't think, I don't know if we've ever had an issue of a Star Trek comic with Klingon, butt in it. Um, so this is a first <laughs> um, and okay, I, uh, that's all I have to say, but you, well, we also see their back. So I like seeing the spine that connects them to the back of the head. So yeah, we've got some naked Klingons, but you know, my favorite part isn't the naked Klingons in the snow <laughs> showing their butts. <laughs> my favorite is before that, when they are in the cavern with the, the fire, the, the lava mm -hmm. or whatever that's going around them, they have to try to see if they can stand the heat. And so, it, you know, they, there's a Klingon that says every student who enters our gates should be able to bear the heat of taklapok until we offer them rep respite. But the thing is, I thought this is Voke, not in the comic, but Voke putting his hand in the fire. Mm, in discovery yeah. to show Takuma Takuvma that, you know, he's should be the next whatever I forget whatever that was. The torch yeah, the torchbearer. Bearer. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, because he's showing Takuvma he can stand the heat. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting thought, and it might kind of remind Takuvma of this period in his life when he was undergoing these trials and how has him uh, identify with Voke and and bond with him that way. That's interesting. It also reminded me of the uh, the traveling the road of Kalhaya, which of course is the um, what what all the the Klingon bachelor party before a Klingon wedding, basically. And I mean that's a pretty deep cut uh, reference to Deep Space Nine, but you know where they have to stand the heat and deprivation. Or get out of the kitchen. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. I, I want to say at this point too, I mean, I make jokes about, you know, naked Klingons and stuff. <laughs> We're going back to that. The art, <laughs> but, yeah. But, you know, I, I make jokes and stuff, but the artwork really is incredible. There's some great shots here. And, <laughs> great shots uh, of Klingon you know, butt. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, there is I that. know you're trying to be serious, <laughs> but I can't help it. Keep going. <laughs> Well, I mean, like, even that whole sequence, you know, when they are out in the snow, like, the artwork here is just really great. And it, I don't know, it makes me feel really cold to see them trying to um, survive in this and with no clothes. And it, I don't know. I just, the, the artwork is really stunning. Well, here. we're going to have to remember this because Tony, Ch uh, Tony Chastain is the art, does the art in this book. And uh, I met him a few months ago, and we talked about him coming on the show. So maybe you can tell him in person sometime. Yeah. 
did a real good job on those Klingon butts, I gotta say. <laughs> it's too bad that we name the episode usually by what's in the feature because Naked Klingons in the Snow is already a pretty good title. <laughs> I'm writing it down. <laughs> All right. Well, so basically Takuvma is spending his time here at uh, Boreth, learning the ways of Kalis and having visions. And he's kind of growing into his own and he's, he's becoming, he's learning a lot about Kalis and the legend behind him, but he's called away from Boreth with the announcement of his sister's impending marriage into the house of Mokai, which really surprises Takuvma because he saw his sister going down a different path. He didn't figure that that's what she was going to do, but he has to leave to, in his words, honor his sister and, uh, and attend back home on Kronos. And when he gets back there, he finds things have changed. What did you think of, of that part of the story where he kind of has to leave and figure out what's going on with his sister there? When he leaves uh, to go to the wedding or to go back to Borath? Oh, when he's, when he's leaving Borath. Okay, when he's leaving Borath. Um, I felt that he didn't want to leave, but he felt the duty to leave. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the right thing to do. But I think he realizes when he gets back home that he's outgrown his brothers who used to pick on him all the time. And he's disappointed in his sister because he's seeing his sister as the one who inspired him to move forward, to learn about Kalis and to redeem the Klingon honor and through Kalis. And, and now she's getting married and moving away from that and doesn't seem to be as interested anymore. And I think there's just, he, there's all this disappointment that he has in his family and he's just so focused on mm -hmm. his, his goal. Yeah. I, I kind of like this new role he seems to have. He almost seems like a warrior monk yeah. because he's so centered and kind of at peace and uh, like his like his sister points out, his brothers seem almost afraid of him now, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And he wants to return to Boreth and he also, you know, wants to get on the ship and start doing everything. You know, it's like we're, we're preparing for him to get to where we saw him in Discovery. And yeah. So speaking of the ship, we see that he's made a lot of progress uh, in his absence on you know, fixing up the ship and making it almost space worthy. They basically just have to finish repairing the hull. And they also reveal to Takuvma, well, his sister reveals to him something that he didn't know about the ship, that it can cloak. So this is apparently the origin of the Klingon cloaking device that we see in Discovery. She says, a century ago, our house created technology that would give our flagship an advantage over every other, an invisibility shield. And so I, that's a really cool scene. I, I like the image of that, them walking outside the ship. And he's like, what are you trying to show me? And she's like, this. And the ship disappears. Yeah, it takes uh, a few uh, panels that just shows it's fading away. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing. I, I also really like that effect in Discovery of it how it cloaks with that green energy kind of yeah. coruscating over it, I guess. But anyway. <laughs> no, I like that too. Yeah. Um, and then he's talking to this older gentleman that is basically like, yeah, your sister, she's kind of moving on your brothers. They don't have any interest in the ship. And he's now almost becoming more of the mentor to him. Like his sister was. Yeah. And that I'm, I'm curious about that relationship there. Exactly. But, uh, and I'm also curious about what he says about his sister's motives and that she's not, you know, she's got her own agenda and she isn't really following the path that they had, that had been laid out for her kind of thing. That's, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting that. But speaking of things that we don't expect, <laughs> he goes to basically, um, where, you know, the House Mokai people are gathering, I guess. And uh, we get this scene at the end where he discovers all of his brothers have been killed. And 
<laughs> the guy that her sister is going to marry. He says, you must be Takuvma. I am Delor of House Mokai, betrothed to your sister. If you wish to avoid the shameful fate of your brothers here, kneel to me now. So this is definitely not, you know, a joining of houses. It's House Mokai wanting to make Takuvma's house its vassal, I guess. <laughs> Bow to my house and, and become absorbed into it, I guess. Yeah, that was really weird. I like that really mm -hmm. shocked me. You're right. It's the last page. It's one full panel on that takes up the full page. And I, I, I was like, wait, what? Wait, wait, what's going on? Who just killed who? What did he say? His brothers? Wait, is this the guy that's marrying his sister? I was like, what is going on? And I realized, OK, this is probably the last page. And it is to be continued. <laughs> Yeah, really unexpected ending. And this makes me just more curious about what her what his sister is up to. Like is she oh, you think she's reluctantly behind this? going along? Yeah, cuz she's she's standing there with him on the platform over the killed. What? I didn't notice that. Wait. I I was switching pages. Wait, I have to go back and yeah. look. That's her. <gasps> so that, that is her. It's very small. Yeah. But I mean, is she, I mean, she could be, uh, being coerced or being forced, I guess, but I don't know, maybe she's not because we did get the other guy saying that her motives are changed now. Mm. So is this a betrayal? It could be very well. Could be. I wonder how then this affects Takuvma and what he does later when we see him on Star Trek Discovery. Hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. that's why he has trust issues maybe with Laurel. Yeah, who is, you know, half house Takuvma, half, half house Mokai. Mm -hmm. So very We'll interesting. find out. She's the one who's basically telling the story in the comic to vote. Mm -hmm. Which I forgot was kind of the framing idea of the story, but they do go back to that at one point. And Voke is... Uh, almost disappointed that Takuvma isn't the leader right off the bat and that ha that he hadn't told them this story before. So it's just a little interesting side note there. And Laurel's like, why are you disappointed? Is it because the leader, the person who had this idea was a woman? He's like, no, no, not at all. Like, no, I, I just, you know, surprised Takuvma didn't tell us this story. And uh, she's like, oh, well, she was just the spark that started it anyway. Takuvma is the true hero of the story i wonder so. if the story is true yeah well that's the thing too is because it's a story being told you could have an unreliable narrator yep. there and house mokai is the house of lies and deceit so who, who knows? knows it's getting interesting <laughs> yeah definitely looking forward to issue number three which we should get in the next little while i think i so. hope so <laughs> Definitely, especially with that cover they show with uh, uh, Cole on the cover. That's a pretty cool one. Yes, yeah. It's. I want, but I, I guess he'll be in that issue then. Possibly, I guess. I mean, this one, the main cover had Voke, and he was just—he's just still there hearing the yeah. story. He wasn't a big part in it yet. No, so. but he is there though. But yeah, small. That's part. true. So yeah, final thoughts. What did you think of this one? Um. I think it, it's it's making the story more intriguing. I want to see how it connects to what we've learned in the series of Discovery. I like the fact that we're getting more background to these Klingons and to to Kuvma, um, and Kal and you know the whole influence of Kalis. And again, my favorite part is the the fire because I made the connection with Voke, like you said, the torchbearer. Him putting his fist in the fire. That's what I thought when I read that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, that's cool. It, I like this. I, I'm I'm really liking it. I'm I'm so ready because that last panel. <laughs> I want to know. Wait, what's happening? I want to read the <laughs> next one like right now. So, what what do you think of it? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, this one I think has gotten me into the story a lot. It's it's pulled me in. I'm really interested in what's going going to happen next. Even though we know where it all ends up, I think the journey is has gotten a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. So, yeah, really enjoying this one for sure. 
Well, what do you say we jump into the feature and talk about some different comics, ones that are quite a bit older than these ones? I bet they're just as good. I, sure, let's say that. All right, let's turn the page and see what we've got. Well, a few weeks ago, we started our journey of reviewing the fourth volume of the Star Trek Gold Key Archives from IDW. This is the reprinting of the old Gold Key comics, the our favorites from back in the 60s and 70s. And we're going to be talking about the second half of volume four of the Gold Key Archives in this episode. So this, of course, makes up the last three issues in that book. We've got issue number 22, Siege in Superspace. Issue number 23, Child's Play, and issue number 24, The Trial of Captain Kirk, which has a very familiar title. But let's start with that first one, that Siege in Superspace. So, oh boy. Superspace, I I don't know, is this is this better than subspace? Is it... Well, I think is it this? is. I, the thing I, I really love about this issue is we haven't had uh, many stories at all about superspace in Star Trek. So finally, mm-hmm. after all this time, it's like, when are we going to get a super space <laughs> issue or story? And it's like, we finally get there. And, um, what, uh, gosh, what, what the heck is super space <laughs> anyway? It's some kind of weird I mean, dimensional we, we... something, or I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we've had subspace, we've had okay space, we've had meh space, but now we're getting super space. So How do you cool. get to super space, Dan? <laughs> well, apparently you go through something. Well, first, let me ask you a question, <laughs> Bruce. Have you ever heard of a black hole? Hmm, I'm afraid not, Dan. Please explain. <laughs> well, we're joking here because very early on, the Enterprise is cruising along and they encounter some sort of stellar phenomenon. They're detecting some energy uh, and it's causing their systems to malfunction. And Kirk asks, where's the energy coming from? And Spock asks Kirk, have you ever heard of a black hole? And Captain Kirk, pioneer of space, who's been a captain, he's gone to the Academy, he knows everything there is to know about starship operations and flying around the galaxy, says, I'm afraid not, Mr. Spock. Please explain, what is this black hole you speak of? And Spock gets a whole (laughs) panel explaining what a black hole is then. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And I mean, obviously, we're being a little hard on this comic. Um, The average reader, when it came out, probably hadn't heard of a black hole. They were actually very um, new ideas around the time that this comic came out. If you remember... I'm going into the history lesson here. The episode uh, Tomorrow is Yesterday from the first season of Star Trek was when something like this was kind of first postulated, but they didn't really have a name for it yet. And Spock says that they've been thrown black in, back in time by uh, the gravitational forces of a black star, which is basically a black hole. So, you know, the terminology wasn't even really around then. So, you know, we can give them a bit of a pass for not knowing exactly and and having to explain it to us, the audience, but it was still reading this in 2018, a really funny line from Captain Kirk. No, I have no idea what a black hole is. I've never heard of that before. Well, and prior to that, uh, Kirk says, where's the energy coming from? So if you read it like, you know, Kirk saying, well, where is the energy coming from? Spock just looks at him and is like, have you ever heard of a black hole, Captain? (laughs) And then I guess he could. I like snarky I guess, Spock. I guess then Kirk could say, "I'm afraid not, Mister Spock. Please explain." <laughs> oh God, this again? Yeah, I have no idea what a black hole is, Spock. Could you explain it to me? Yeah, I could see that. That's a that's an interesting. That's, reading that's in it. my head. Snarky canon. Spock and sarcastic. Yeah, Kirk. I'm trying. I'm trying <laughs> to save this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So they get pulled in by this black hole. This weird black hole and every time the term black hole comes up now throughout the rest of this comic it will have quote marks around it which i think is really funny yes. too it is a- i almost have to imagine that the character that spock every time he says it he's like it appears we are being pulled in by the and he turns around and raises his fingers black hole 
Well, does no, the he quote does the quote around. thing, but like with the Vulcan salute, he has the <laughs> he does it like that. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> I wish everybody could see that. Yeah, you know, just do the Vulcan salute and like you're doing quotes though. Black hole. Yeah. When exactly. we go to Star Trek Las Vegas, that's how we'll greet each other every time we see each other. Black hole. <laughs> Well, so the Enterprise gets pulled through this black hole, this black <laughs> there hole, you go. and they end up, <laughs> I hear it every time I hear the quote marks now, um, and they end up in super space, they call it, and they're in orbit, or there's a nearby planet in this super space, and they decide to investigate it, and basically it's it's Kirk uh mccoy and uhura who beam down and sulu i guess is it sulu no, no not sulu. Not just Sorry. The three of them just just kirk mccoy and uhura i'm getting my stories mixed up here they beam down and they come under attack by living plants again again with the living plants in gold key comics what is going on here that was my first thought was oh no deadly foliage again we've got Killer plants. Are they going to have to nuke the whole planet again? <laughs> and not just that, but uh, these, if anybody, of course, the majority of people who are listening to this aren't looking at this issue and probably haven't read it, but we're not just talking about living plants that, you know, maybe there's a vine that moves or something like plants that look humanoid, you know, they're walking around on legs and have arms and f- holding fists in the air. Like we have plant monsters like that but not even just this comic but the other ones that we talked we'll get to i'm seeing a pattern of these comics like you're saying like oh here we've got plants attacking again and it's like there's other things and other issues that remind me of past issues you know it's like i feel like some of these ideas are being reused fairly often yeah there is definitely (laughs) shades of of what have what has come before and they broke the prime directive yeah and I mean, even just the idea of a planet where all the people have been, you know, killed out due to war or are underground hiding from something like this all feels really yeah, familiar. Yeah. yeah, there always seems to be plants where everybody's hiding. Uh, there's some civilization that's, I, I don't know, they're all attacking one another <laughs> or something, you know, it's just, <laughs> I don't know. But in this, then they, they beam down to the planet, and then this woman runs up to them. And I'm like, okay, they're not a warp-compatible compa- society or anything. Like, you know, it's like they just beam down, and someone's like, hey, hi! <laughs> yeah, I mean, prime dire- directive concerns are just right out the window at this point. But uh, they, they find out basically the story of the planet from her, um, basically they had a defense system that they put a brain into and it ended up killing everyone and wiping everyone out except for a few who were able to escape underground. So my thought of course here is you never ever put a brain or a powerful brain in a weapon. A, a thinking weapon is never a good thing. Like, do you remember that Voyager episode Warhead with those little warheads and the one took over the doctor? And yes. It's just, you know, bombs that can talk and think. That's never a good idea. Let's not let's not do that. Scientists of the world, if you're listening, don't put brains in weapons, please. This is not going to end well. Yes. Let's <laughs> leave the brains to our world leaders instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you put it that way <laughs> i just love your reaction you're like uh, uh, yeah yeah well you got me there darn it well let's rethink <laughs> all of this we'll get back to you <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> so this woman recounts her story and she tells about how you know they they're exploring the surface and they came under attack by these plant things and, um, you know, her partner, her significant other has, uh, this bracelet and, you know, as he died, he gave it to her. He, she made very, she made certain to mention that in her story because that's very important. Uh, oh yeah. It's very important. <laughs> now, of course, as soon as I read this, 
this bracelet's going to come back, right? It's going to be important. You you picked up on that too, Well, yeah. I didn't know how it was going to be important, but I knew there was (laughs) something about it. But yeah, let's keep going because I want to comment on that because it's really kind of crazy. Yeah. So, of course, it's going to be the key to solving it all. (laughs) And... Basically, yeah, okay. Well, we'll we'll jump right to the end. We're we're not going to necessarily do this all in order. The one of the little trinkets on this bracelet. Basically, he collects shiny things and puts them on a bracelet, and one of these shiny things turns out to be the the lost brain that was at the center of this machine that controls all of the the defense systems and stuff. Just by, you know, random happenstance. That's what it is. Yeah, okay. And anyway. But then we find out that it's the thing that's causing these vegetable monsters. <laughs> vegetable metalloid monsters, I will point out they call them at one yes. point. Yes. Well, that this is this bracelet, this item, this brain thing or whatever is causing these things to come and attack them. But what I don't get is her lover who was dying has had this bracelet with this, and they weren't attacking him when he had it. And then he gives it to her and he doesn't tell her like anything that's wrong with it. He just says, I hope you treasure it always. And then he dies. And my, and what's really funny to me is she's telling the story to the crew. And as she's talking about how all these things had been happening and uh, well, I guess the monsters were attacking when he had the bracelet, but it wasn't like they were following him or his bracelet. Like he never put two and two together. And I, it, I would think he'd had this bracelet over time. But then when he dies, mm-hmm. that was just a, less than an hour ago. Because then she's like, mm-hmm. and that was barely an hour ago. You know the rest. It's like, whoa, what? This is just like, <laughs> she just lost her lover and less than an hour ago. She's like, hey, you people, hi, look, I got a bracelet. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird. Now, my impression was when we we find out that, of course, the the brain thing is on this bracelet, my impression was that he kept adding pieces to it and just found that part shortly before they were attacked and wiped out. Maybe that could be. That was my guess. It's it's not entirely clear, but that was kind of what I thought was he was just. That was the most recent addition to it, I guess. Right. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And he puts yeah. it on. He takes the time to put in the bracelet as the veggie monsters are attacking. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. So, of course, you know, she leads them, the landing party, to their civilization, which is underground. And the vegetable metalloid monsters <laughs> attack. I really hope I, oh man, if the gold key comics were canon, I wonder if these would be in the Star Trek encyclopedia under vegetable metalloid monsters, because that is just an incredible name. I think we have to have the Akutas on again and ask if <laughs> how they would put this in the, and it also looks like the monsters have metal masks and, and yeah, bracelets. they have their own bracelets, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and they're able to shoot like laser beams or something. I don't, I don't know how plants are able to do that. So it's something to do with the metal parts, I guess. I, I don't know. They, yeah. I don't know. There's maybe one, maybe in sense. season two <laughs> discovery, they'll, they'll attack this. And they... Oh God. <laughs> if the writers of discovery are getting ideas from gold key comics, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm no, I'm all in. I want to see what they do with that. <laughs> I'll admit it. I'll, I'd still watch. <laughs> and of course, these lasers or everything come out there. It goes, Pararaum. <laughs> Pararaum. Yep. Yep. That's, that's the sound that, that lasers make. Anyway. So yeah, they're getting attacked in the underground city because, and they eventually find out because the, the brain on the bracelet is leading them there. And Kirk notices every time that these creatures get close to this woman, the bracelet glows. So that's kind of how he puts two and two together. But in the meantime, they've they've broken into the old storeroom where all the weapons are kept because this society has become utterly pacifistic. They don't believe in weapons of any kind. So, of course, when these things attack, they're 
um, they're not prepared to defend themselves at all. And I almost feel like this story is trying to get into a little bit of social commentary because, you know, when they get into the storehouse full of the weapons, you know, the woman says something along the lines of, like, is this how it's always going to be? We're always going to have to resort to using weapons. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's almost like they have something interesting they want to say there, but it it kind of that gets dropped by the wayside because it, it is just a comic story. We're not going to get too yeah, deep. Yeah, they kind of go into this as if because the they have weapons cause the problems to begin with. And now mm-hmm. we're going to keep going back to the weapons to solve the problem that were caused because of weapons. Yeah. So Kirk eventually realizes that the the brain is on this bracelet and he he orders her to take it off and throw it on the ground and he shoots it and she's of course I just lost my lover 2 hours ago <laughs> who gave me that bracelet what are you doing and but you know of course it stops the creatures and the civilization is saved but they're still trapped in super space they've still got to get back home Now this was interesting to me i misread this initially and had to go back and reread the story because i thought spock said that the local star was about to go nova in six hours and i'm like okay the the stars the star just happens to be about to go nova in six hours and they're like oh we could harness that energy to get back to um regular space and of course that's what they do they harness it and they they blast the brain into the into the collapsing star so that it's destroyed and they, it makes it go Nova and they create a new black hole and fly back to regular space. And of course manage to survive the trip completely in one piece somehow. Um, and I was like, Oh, and everyone's safe because we destroyed the brain. And I'm like, no, they're not. Their star just blew up. But then I realized, okay, it was just a nearby star. Not, not there. No, my initial reaction too was that, because uh, he tells Kirk, yeah, there's a star that's about to go Nova. And I was like, oh, crap, the guy, they have to save these people. But instead, Kirk's like, great, we could use that to get back home. And I was like, wait, what? Wait, the star's going Nova. It's going to destroy their planet. And then I just made the assumption, oh, it must be a further, like you said, further away. And then they said something about if they use warp speed, they could get there in time. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the writer of this story Like he's got the black hole and he explains exactly how it was created. He talks about how a neutron star collapses to create a black hole. We've got a supernova happening. And uh, I I feel like the writer must have just gotten his hands on some astronomy textbooks or, you know, an interesting paper about astronomy right before writing the story, because he's really working in a lot of really interesting stellar phenomena. And jokes about you know what's a black hole putting that aside like there's some really interesting real world physics and stuff that's being put into the story which surprised me for a gold key story if that makes sense yeah and i i think so too and i liked early in the issue when they're going through the quote black hole into quote super space uh <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> well, okay so maybe not all the astronomy is great but <laughs> no i mean it's fine but i mean because also you know i you know at the time of this writing they're also thinking kids probably you mm-hmm. know more than anything but and this was this came out in early 1974 so you know the animated series was on which you know was on saturday mornings so that was kind of geared towards kids even though the writing for both that and kind of these comics are a little more you know smart (laughs) you know a little more like appeal to adults Mm -hmm. you know not just you know they're not smurfs or something but anyway um when they're going through the black hole there's a panel of them going through whatever the dimensional area to get into super space and it reminded me of the wormhole in deep space nine as they're going through it doesn't look Mm -hmm. exactly like that but just like the there's like different images and things going on as if they're traveling through something like that ds9 wormhole yeah, no, that's that's a good uh, that's a good ana- good interpretation. It's probably this comic where they got the idea for Deep Space Nine. Oh, I'm I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. the 
the writers of the first Borg episode read that last one with the cyborg mummies, and then the Deep Space Nine writers read this one. Yeah, because yeah, totally. the Bajorans were supposed to originally be vegetables. They just <laughs> didn't have the budget to do it. Oh, man. Don't let Major Kira hear you say that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, of course, you know, they've they've got out, they're safe, and the planet's supposedly safe. They're way over there in super space, though, so we'll never see them again. And the Enterprise flies off to its next Yay. mission. Yay! What is that next mission? Because <laughs> we've got it. Well, <laughs> apparently, I one thing I noticed with these comics is they always start out with the Enterprise flying towards some mission that they never get to. Because something else happens, which I mean is kind of par for the course for Star Trek. So in this one, the Enterprise is on the mission, on mission to the planet. No, sorry. They've just finished their mission to the planet Kynardi. But Kynardi wasn't in this cruising. past issue, right? That's just. Right. This is, this is something that happened in between the issues, <laughs> okay. I guess. So they're finished their mission on the planet Kynardi and they're cruising toward the solar system Zeta Centauri uh, seeking further class M planets for study, but of course they get a distress call and are diverted from that. And they go to the planet Argylus. It's kind of like Argelius, but not. <laughs> <laughs> I like Argelius. <laughs> <laughs> so they beam down to this planet Ar Argylus, which has sent the distress call, and find themselves. I'm I'm going to gloss through this quickly because I have no idea what's going on here. They find themselves in some sort of weird chess game, yeah. I guess. And there's they're being attacked by knights on. But see again, that's what's reminding me of past issues where we've seen we've seen like knights and castles and things. Oh, just wait till yeah. They mention pirates in the third one, and I'm like, oh god, are we getting real pirates? Anyway, <laughs> Johnny Depp's in it too. Oh yeah. Oh, oh boy. I, and uh, so, yeah, they they fight off these knights and eventually they're taken uh, captive and they're introduced to King Simon, who is a young boy, but a king. He looks like he's drunk, and, too. Uh, he does. He's kind of always got this like lounging in his chair look, hand up in the air. He's. Yeah, he's got not a care in the world and possibly underage drinking as well. Okay, so this is one of my favorite parts because they're taken to this castle, like you said, and they see King Simon like just kind of almost falling out of the throne drunk looking. And as they walk in, King Simon says, welcome, men of the Enterprise. And Kirk's like, you know who we are? Then it was you who sent the distress signal? He's like, not personally, but it was done at my command. But anyway, I'm not going to read it all. But he goes to explain that the reason mm. that he knows who they are is because, well, their civilization is very advanced. That's it. <laughs> they're advanced. That's, That's how it. they know that they're from the Enterprise. This ship shows out of nowhere, and he knows exactly who they are because, well, you know, we're we're very advanced. But then by the next page... Kirk says something about, you know, the Federation <laughs> and the King's like, what's that? What, what, what Federation are you talking about? And Kirk's like, well, of course, how would you know? And I'm like, because they're advanced. <laughs> and they know about the, this, and, and this is not like, this is not like way later in the story. This is three panels later. <laughs> right. Like what? <laughs> yeah, no, this is, it's really bizarre. To what Federation, Captain? I said, of course, yeah. How would you know about that? Well, you just said that they're from the Enterprise and you know that. And like, hey. Okay, anyway, I, so, I, I, so I, will, I will put logic to this. <laughs> when he says we're an advanced civilization, it could be that they have, you know, big telescopes that they saw the Enterprise and read this weird name on it because it's a different language and different planet. And he knew they were from the ship called enterprise, but he never heard of the Federation, but they could see the ship and it said enterprise on it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sure. <laughs> we'll go with that. Well, on this planet, the reason why the King is so young and everyone around him is so young is apparently this, there's a plague that causes death for all people 
at age 13, exactly age 13. They turn 13, they die. That's it. And, but the kids are all very intelligent. So the kids of this world are very smart, I guess, but they are still children physically and emotionally. Well, so, and the fact that they all die at 13 is really cut into all the bar mitzvahs. There just aren't any anymore. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. <laughs> Well, obviously, everyone dying at age 13 is a big problem because, you know, the entire civilization will die out. And they don't explicitly say why the entire civilization will die out if everyone dies at 13. But we as the reader can infer that they obviously cannot have kids of their own if they only live to age 13. So the society would end because even though they are, in their own words, very intelligent and very advanced, they are still kids. So um, <laughs> I have to say, we, we meet a doctor later to Dr. Roy. And I love the looks of this guy, the like nerdy kid with the really big glasses. Who's the doctor? <laughs> I, I did too. I remember when I saw him, I laughed. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's because he's got this little hat thing on and the glasses and he's just so young. It's just, he looks very nerdy. <laughs> yeah i kind of say i love the character designs in this story i don't know what it is like even even the king uh king simon like he's just i don't know he's got a look to him he's i don't know doesn't care about anything he's very relaxed i don't know i like i like the designs yeah also i think this is probably the first time we've seen nurse chapel in the comics is that right uh it may be you you may be right. I, I we haven't seen her. If we if she has appeared, it was very early on. Mm -hmm. So we get Nurse Chapel on the landing party because they want McCoy back on the Enterprise for the other side of the story, which is searching for an ingredient that they need for the cure to this plague. Because the landing party, which has landed on the planet is now infected as well and will die in five days uh, without the cure. So the race is on and the enterprise discovers that there is a cure for this plague, but they lack one essential ingredient, which is on the, on a planet on the other side of the galaxy. And the name of that planet is ominous. Now I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying the name is ominous sounding. <laughs> the name is actually ominous. Is it ominous or is it ominous sound? Wait, um, wait, you're confusing me, Dan. <laughs> Are they going to make it to the planet, yeah. though? I mean, is there anything that's going to get in its way from getting there? Well, they say it's two days there and two days back. So they could theoretically make it within the five days. But as we know, the Enterprise has a history of being waylaid by, uh, hostile aliens, spatial anomalies, and other kinds of stuff. So, you know, there's no guarantee. And McCoy's not willing to put money on them making it back in five days. So, I, I don't know. know. Well, I do know that as they go to travel there, they're, they're going to, they could get uh, destroyed by a huge meteorite or asteroid or whatever. Yes. <laughs> so, they're traveling at extremely high warp speeds but there's a meteor that's gonna a hit meteor them, which a meteor which now the last guy the the last issue was written by somebody who'd read some astronomy textbooks i don't think this one was because a meteor is uh i is it right that it has to have entered a planet's atmosphere to be called a meteor now i'm questioning myself i might be wrong you may that. be right <laughs> you may be crazy <laughs> well, I know I'm crazy, but well, you have to, it has to enter the atmosphere to have the meteor shower. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's it is um so a meteoroid is uh something that I think has to start heading towards a planet. Right. Okay. So here's the dictionary def definition of meteor, a small body of matter from outer space that enters the Earth's atmosphere, becoming incandescent as a result of friction and appearing as a streak of light. So 
they're not going to get hit by a meteor. They're going to get hit by an asteroid, an asteroid that must be traveling faster than light if the Enterprise can't avoid it flying at warp. <laughs> and must be able to change direction because if you were about to be hit by an asteroid, we'll go with asteroid now, you would, you know, move to the left or turn this way or turn that way out of, out of the direction of the asteroid. Oh, no, it must be turning with them. <laughs> they can't outrun it and they can't <laughs> outmaneuver it. Yeah. So that's, of course, the cliffhanger we're left with for part one of this story. And in part two, Spock manages to avoid it. <laughs> that's the that's the resolution, I guess. Yeah. Bas- well, because <clears throat> they slow down. So that yep. they can save enough energy to make their shields more powerful and they let the meteorite hit them. It's a, you know, and boom and just, up. Oh, shields are strong enough. We can keep going now. It just bounced right off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So meanwhile, back on the planet, uh, Kirk and his landing party, as well as King Simon, are all captured by a rival group. Uh, led by a warlord by the name of Yago. Yes. <laughs> and he demands a cure for the disease. He says, you know, you must have the cure. And Kirk says, well, we're working on it. But he says, no, you must have it. Give it to us now or you will all die. And he takes them all prisoner. And uh, basically, he's kind of a rival gang to King Simon's group. And captures all of them and holds them prisoner, threatening to kill them, of course. Yes. Um, <laughs> actually, the, it was at this point that I started to really like this one. Yeah. Because it's just the, you got these of... kids and, and there's like two rival gangs of these kids and they're arresting the adults and they're threatening to kill them. And it's like, okay, wh- you know, why are they fighting one another and also to the point of violence and wanting to kill. But then the King just kind of plays it off. Like it's not that big of a deal. And they're referring to it as like a game. Yeah. So yeah, I was getting into it here and then of course, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the resolution of it for sure. But you know, basically uh, the enterprise has arrived at the planet ominous (laughs) to get this ingredient every time i say it it sounds more and more ridiculous um to get this ingredient to cure uh, to create the cure and they encounter uh natives of this world and another prime directive violation oh yeah well actually they figure that they are they won't violate the prime directive they only will if they use their advanced weapons on on these guys that are coming to attack them but if they use their weapons it's not a violation of the prime directive so we get this panel of (laughs) mccoy and spock just (laughs) walloping these guys with clubs (laughs) <laughs> i'm sorry this is so ridiculous they're just beating these guys over the head i mean this this one shot of spock just swinging this club and knocking this guy silly i mean he's dead like he's killed the guy he has to have with how hard he's hit him here and you know so it becomes we can't violate the prime directive so we'll just club the natives like it's Oh, man. Okay. Well, I, okay. I have to read. So the scene, you know, McCoy says, and this is everything you just said, but I just like the dialogue of it. McCoy's like, you know, the Federation forbids us to interfere with the natural development of a civilization, so we can't use modern weapons against them. And Spock says, elementary, my dear doctor, as if he's, you know, Sherlock Holmes, elementary, my dear doctor, if we can't use our own weapons, and then the next panel, they're, like you said, they're just whacking them up. And Spock yells, we'll use theirs. Take care not to injure them seriously. We came here to save lives, not take them. And after they club them all, the others start running away. As as he's hit this guy incredibly hard in the <laughs> yes. temple with a club. 
<laughs> Have you ever heard of a Take Vulcan care not to injure pinch, them seriously. You know? Bang! Use the nerve pinch, Spock. Come on. <laughs> and then McCoy's like, it works, Spock. The others are retreating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah. <laughs> After that ridiculous display, they they get the ingredient and speed off back to Argylus with the cure. And meanwhile, back on Argylus, Kirk overpowers the kids who are holding them at gunpoint and gets a gun away from them and says, you know, basically, I hope I don't have to use this because they're just kids. And some other more guards burst in and Kirk's not close enough to take them down by hand. So, you know, they raise their weapon and Kirk raises his weapon and he hesitates just for a second and then he fires. But it just fires a little harmless ray of light that doesn't hurt the guy at all. And it turns out that it's all just a big game. They're kids and they're not, they're not actually going to kill them. They don't have real guns. And I don't know. I was a little gutted at this point because it, it felt like, Oh, okay. It's all just a game and it's just all kind of silly. And it turns out that King Simon and this warlord, they're like, Oh no, no, we're cool. Okay. Yeah, we and the warlord guy's like, oh, we we know there's no cure. We were just having some fun with you before you die, I guess. <laughs> it just seemed a little weird to me. Like it just, oh, okay. Like what a twist, you know. I like actually like this scene because as they're in the cell and Kirk's trying to figure out what to do, he says, you know, I've I've put off my decision for the sake of the kids. I couldn't bring myself to hurt them, but now it comes down to our lives or theirs and that isn't even a choice and when these kids come in with the guns kirk you know says now and grabs one of the gun and the other crew members are wrestling with the kids to grab the weapons and they're trying not to hurt them and one of the kids like you know hey you're spoiling our fun you know and all of a sudden like you said more kids start coming in and then they start holding their weapons ready to shoot them and kirk's you know hesitating you know he doesn't want to take a child's life but he's a about to get killed and his crew's going to get killed so he makes the ultimate decision that he's going to go ahead and fire the gun at the kid before he shoots him it's almost like you know star wars you know who shot first greedo or han in this case who shot first was kirk <laughs> and he shoots the kid and nothing happens and kirk's like y y you're still standing and the kid just kind of shrugs it off and goes why not these rifles fire only harmless rays of light <laughs> <laughs> I just love the expression on his face. Like, Why not? <laughs> and that's no. I mean, I I guess I I do really like that that kind of introspection by Kirk. That moment is really cool, and I I think it's more depth than we usually get in right. these comics. So, yeah, no, you're that that's fair. There's kind of a deeper level to this than I'm really giving it credit for. I think. Yeah. So I I, I liked it, and you know, and I'm just looking at the last panel because of the captain's log star date. And all these issues, we always have a star date that's two digits and then a colon, two digits, and then a period, and then a single digit. And it's interesting that in 1974, they're still writing the star dates that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it kind of, like, if you listen to the show, it kind of sounds like that, maybe. Captain's Log, star date 1852.9. Yeah, yeah, could be. So, yeah, I guess. But, Maybe they thought it's like the yeah. time. It's 1832.9. <laughs> well, yeah, this one, I I think it was an interesting story. I mean, again, there's still a lot of those uh, familiar elements of the gold key stories coming into it that I, I think are maybe a little bit overused sometimes, but, you know, not not a horrible one. And, and you know, these aren't all that bad. They really are. I mean, there's some parts like we're making fun of, but they're so fun to talk about. <laughs> you know, once you start like discussing That's them true. out loud, it becomes really silly. Well, speaking of really silly, <laughs> we have the third issue in this series, in the in this book, the trial of Captain Kirk, and we get a. Again, like most of these comics, we we get kind of a non sequitur opening that has, you know, a little bit of a preview of something that's going to happen later in the story before we, we get into the story. And we've got Spock and McCoy lying 
in stasis tubes and two robots talking. And it turns out the robots are Spock and McCoy. And uh, McCoy says, it's strange, Mr. Spock, looking at your own body this way. But with our brain patterns inside these robots, we can move freely on the deadly planet Kibo. And Spock says, yes, Dr. McCoy, but there's not much for us to get down. But there's not much time for us to get down there to find the evidence to save the captain. And you're like, what is going on here? Yeah, these these first panels are always, the little preview, are always a little more out there than even the story itself. So here we go with the trial of Captain Kirk. And it you put a note in the comic, and it's interesting because the title sounds familiar. We did cover, actually, on Literary Treks as well, I believe or no it was who killed yeah captain i looked kirk. back it, who killed captain covered. kurt was covered uh but yeah there was and i remember and i haven't read it probably since it came out but you know there was a three-part comic in the dc comics run the second dc comics run of star trek and this would have been 1990 and there the issues the story was called the trial of james t kirk now this gold key is the trial of james kirk the DC Comics one, 1990, was the trial of James T. Kirk. And that issue, hmm. uh, those three issues were re- written by Peter David. And I think, and those were issues 10 through 12, if anybody wants to go find them. And again, that's the second run of the Star Trek line with DC Comics, issues 10 through 12. And they were written by Peter David. And I think that was the first comic story that Peter David wrote at, uh, for DC, for Star Trek. Oh, interesting. That's cool. But this is not so, the same story. Un- <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, unfortunately, that's not the one we're talking about today. We're talking about this one, Whew, which is interesting, to say the least. Um, it has some some things to recommend it and some things that I think are ridiculous, but that's okay. Uh, so in this one, the Enterprise is sent to break up an illegal iron mining operation, which is run by pirates. And as I mentioned earlier... When I heard pirates, I'm going, oh, no, are these going to be the buccaneers with the peg legs and the parrots and like the old old school pirates that we saw in a previous (laughs) issue of the Gold Key There's Captain Hook with a hook of a hand, you know. (laughs) (laughs) But thankfully, we're not visiting Davy Jones Locker (laughs) and doing all that kind of stuff. People are not saying, yar, me hearties, which is good. So that's that's not happening. (laughs) <laughs> but no, these pirates are running an illegal iron mining operation and they're basically there's this asteroid field and there was an iron rush years ago because they were discovered to contain so much iron. But with the over mining, it started to threaten the local planets with the, the asteroid belt breaking up. So mining there is completely illegal now. And the enterprise has been sent to, try and uncover this illegal mining operation that they know is happening, which seems like, you know, an odd assignment for a prestigious starship of the line. But it turns out this is a really big operation that like no one else has been able to crack. And it's hoped that the enterprise can solve the problem here. Uh, I hope it does. (laughs) Yeah. So iron mining is, is that's, that's bad. (laughs) it, it, It apparently is. Um, and there's fake iron, like whatever that asteroid thing is that's disguised as a ship. Uh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So basically they discover that there's an asteroid that's out of place. That's not on the charts that have been made. And they determine that it's actually a disguised ship and, um, it takes a shot at the enterprise when it's discovered and Kirk orders that the ship completely destroyed. And I thought when I was reading this, I thought that this would be the moment that Kirk was put on trial for, because if you read it, it seems like, you know, he doesn't really try to capture the ship at all or stop it. They, you know, they take a shot at the enterprise which kind of scorches the hull a little bit, he says. So Kirk says, destroy that ship, and they blow it up. And I was like, oh, man, maybe he's going to be put on trial for killing all those people. But no, 
It's something completely different. <laughs> so I didn't notice this the first time I read it, but these these panels that you're talking about right now, we see Kirk call out to the ship, attention, Starship Enterprise to Bandit Ship. And then, you know, like you said, the shooting, the scorches of the ship hall. And then we go and we see the bridge and everybody's tumbling. You see what Kirk's holding in his hand? It looks like a microphone. And if you oh, look at yeah. the bridge, I it's like the cord. <laughs> <laughs> so when he's calling at the ship, he grabbed a microphone like he's, you know, like it's amateur night at the comedy club. <laughs> <laughs> Or he's Dr. Chaotica warning the aliens from the eighth dimension to halt their attacks or something. <laughs> I just think it's interesting because we haven't had that in the other issues. Huh. I never noticed that. That's really interesting. So, yeah. So the Enterprise, like I said, destroys this ship. Um, and Kirk contacts Starfleet Command and says, unfortunately, I had no choice. I had to blow up the ship. And they're like, oh, okay continue on your mission and then immediately thereafter they get another message from starfleet command saying okay you know enterprise return home immediately uh and uh you know we we need you back here right away and the enterprise goes back home and upon disembarking kirk is immediately brought to starfleet command and put under arrest which is interesting yeah, and then there's like his crew are talking to one another. <laughs> I had to point this out because you know when you read comics, especially you know these gold key comics, every all the writing is done in all caps. It's all caps. Mm -hmm. So there's this officer and says, um, "Shall we step outside the ship and go to the beach crad?" K R A D all in caps. And I'm like, "Wait, <laughs> I know somebody who goes by the name of Crad." Oh, Keith R. A. DeCandido, a Star Trek author. <laughs> I wonder if he was, do you think his parents named him after this issue? Uh, he was probably born before 74. <laughs> but I don't know. Man, everybody's just getting inspiration from the Gold Key comics, apparently. <laughs> oh, boy. But that's what I thought. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen that before, except with him. Yeah, no, me neither. And and yeah, I had noticed that as well. That's really cool. So uh, if Keith is listening, you know, you are officially in uh, a character in one of the S Star Trek licensed properties. <laughs> <laughs> and much earlier than you would expect, too. <laughs> so Kirk is brought before Starfleet Command, and it turns out what he's under arrest for is colluding with the pirates. Apparently, seven million credits was put into his bank account, and there's footage of him meeting with uh, the head of the pirate mining operation. So the thought is that he was paid off to make it look like they'd stopped the, the mining operation, but uh, he's actually working in collusion with them, and he's arrested for that. And Kirk and his crew, of course, get together to try and plan a defense. And Spock decides that they should return to the scene of the crime and try and figure out what's going on there. So he takes the Enterprise there. And meanwhile, Kirk himself has some really interesting ideas about uh, how to defend himself. Yeah, so itself. all these stories in the Gold Keys are divided into two parts, part one, part two. So we just finished part one. And at this point... This story isn't too bad. It's not really all that silly. Mm -hmm. It's all, you know, it's it, to me, it's like, okay, this is quite interesting. You know, Kirk's getting himself in trouble and, you know, there's these asteroid things or something. I, and, and I just like the whole dialogue, the crew's having the discussion of what they're going to do, how they're going to deal with the situation with Kirk and the Federation and such. But yeah, then we get to part two. And it ruined the whole thing. It's that's absolutely true. Like you, this first half I'm going, okay, this is breaking the mold. This isn't the same as every other gold key comic we've gotten before. You know, there's something really interesting going on. There's a, a mystery being set up 
you know, Kirk is obviously being framed, but by whom and for what purpose? And I'm really getting into it because, you know, there's not some weird mad despot who's trying to take over a planet through sorcery or, you know, there's no cyborg mummies that are advancing and trying to kill everybody. There's no killer vegetables, which I'm really thankful for. So, you know, it's, it's new and, and interesting. Oddly enough, it's almost because it's a more run of the mill type story in the gold key comics is why it's more interesting to me, yeah. which is interest, which is odd in yep. and of itself. And then you turned the page. Yes. Then unfortunately I turned the page. Well, <laughs> and, and this, this part is really good because we haven't seen plastic surgery like this <laughs> in Star Trek. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> Captain Kirk who is... <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I'm sorry. So Captain Kirk, who is under suspicion of, you know, fraud and um you know, under planet arrest basically, he's not allowed to leave town, basically yes, is what he can told. he can wander around goes, as much as he wants. He has to stay in town though. Yeah, basically. So and where does he wander so off what to? Does he do? <laughs> He immediately goes and gets cosmetic <laughs> surgery to alter his face, but not really because, man, I, I took a screenshot of one of the panels and maybe I'll put that up in the Babel conference later. His face looks exactly the same, <laughs> he has, <laughs> but he has this huge fro of hair on his head, <laughs> which is ridiculous. <laughs> And well, oh, okay. So first of all, getting plastic surgery when you're under suspicion of having committed a crime, like that's not suspicious at all. What a great idea. Um, but this is the, the look that like, as much as I love the character design of the people in the last issue, this is ridiculous. This is, I, I, words can't explain how silly this looks it's just silly it looks well because kirk goes into his friend's office the <laughs> cosmetic surgeon and he's like you understand Dwayne, that if i'm caught you could be implicated and the doctor just with this big old big mustache <laughs> was just leaning in his chair going at my age fear doesn't move me but adventure still does i'm totally bored with removing wrinkles let's go jim <laughs> and then he puts him under this table <laughs> and all these little things. It says like <clears throat> on his face. And he's like, you're right, Dwayne. It's just a tingling sensation. And the doctor says, yes, but in less than a half a minute, your skin will be as malleable as clay. <laughs> and then the next one, there's Kirk with a fro. <laughs> <laughs> So later in the story, we learn that like this eventually wears off and he just like will revert to his old look. So like who's paying to get this done to them that they're like removing wrinkles. But then like two days later, it's like and what wrinkles happens are bad. to the hair like, oh. if he reverts back to himself? <laughs> Does the fur just fall out? <laughs> like, yeah, it just like shrinks back into his head and, and straightens out <laughs> back to his old hairstyle oh my god and i have so well, many I questions have a que I, I, I and so seriously now i have questions because then the next panel the doctor is showing him that hey look here you are look in the mirror you know you look like you're ready to go to a disco party i made you look like a native of the planet dread and then kirk's like magnificent now i've got to go moving got to get moving there's a young lady i'm dying to meet <laughs> i was like what young lady is he dying what to is meet? going on like he's what I got a new look in a fro and I got a lady in mind. <laughs> it's like, that was my thought. I'm like, wait, he's, is he do this? Cause he's like, Hey, you know, I got some free time now. I got a new look. Let me go oh. find a young lady. And then the next thing he's in an elevator and this woman's falling into his arms saying, we're falling. The car is out of control. Yeah. And I'm like, what is going on? 
why is he like <laughs> looking for this young lady? Is this the young lady? And why are they in an elevator and she happens to be falling into him and the elevator's about to crash? And then we find out that every they're safe and she thanks him for saving her. And then you see these maintenance workers walk by going, I know it sounds crazy, <laughs> but we found a wad of gum in the computer controls. And then you see Kirk throw his juicy fruit wrapper in the trash. <laughs> This is all, okay, everything you have just said from Kirk saying, I've got a young lady I'm dying to meet, to all of this happening, to him throwing the wrapper in the garbage, that's one page. <laughs> that is one page of this comic. <laughs> oh my God, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> and I still don't know who this woman is. Yeah, like it's just... It, we don't get that explained until later at all. Like it's, it's so. Well, yeah, you're people. right. We do eventually find out. Who she is, but it's just... I mean, sort of, but it's well, still she works for ridiculous. whatever the Admiral or whoever this guy is that he's trying to find out in from the chair, yeah. the vice chairman, Fado. <laughs> <laughs> so we go back to the enterprise <laughs> and they're chasing another fake asteroid ship which fires a missile at a planet and they're like, okay, well let's go chase that missile now. And this is where we get those robot things. They apparently have the technology to transfer their consciousness out of their bodies, leaving them just lifeless lumps of flesh, I guess, and putting their, their brain patterns into these robots so that they can go down to this planet. And I'm going, what is going Spock on and here? McCoy have put like, their Katras into these robots. <laughs> Sarabots. This was, yeah, Sarabots. Okay, sure. And I guess Scotty's like, I and suffer the worst headaches known for days. I hate those things. <laughs> <laughs> like this is just something that, like, oh man, I had to use one last week to go repair the outside of the warp engine. I hate those bloody and then things. They suck like, their consciousness. This is just common they got, technology. Like, these hoses that look like for like vacuum cleaner <laughs> hoses on their heads. Go. <laughs> Suck into their heads. <laughs> so is it the machine going arg, or is it them going like Like is this like oh my god? Okay, so yeah, they're they're put in the robots. Meanwhile, we're back on Earth with Kirk, and he's investigating this admiral's apartment. With his bro. Or no, sorry, not the admiral's apartment. He basically finds out from this woman. Uh, you know, gets this lead and goes and inves investigates this guy's place. And it turns out he's a, he does visual effects for movies <laughs> and he faked the footage of him, of Kirk meeting with this pirate leader. And he finds all the miniature models and stuff that he uses for his visual effects, which is cool. They still use practical visual effects in the 23rd century. It's not all CG. That's awesome. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the guy comes home and, and holds him up at gunpoint because Kirk has basically found the evidence and then like sat in the guy's home and figured out how it was doctored for like two hours while he figures out how to right, use it. Because he took the equipment. reels of film and puts it on the film projector. <laughs> no, literally. And that's what he's doing. He's in a dark room with the film projector in the 23rd century, still using reel to reel film. <laughs> like, I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I I don't blame you. Um, let's power through it. So because it gets even more interesting, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> stay really tuned. Does. We've got more. <laughs> oh, this this story had and, so and much. And you know, some of you people oh, complain about in the darkness. Pick up this issue. I'll show you some bad Star Trek. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Spock and McCoy are using the Cerebots to investigate this missile that the pirates fired at the planet. And the missile contains all the evidence to exonerate Captain Kirk, I guess. Yeah, I, 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 I had right? to read that like three times and I still don't get it. Why did they why didn't they just throw it into the sun like or, or blow it up like it's a missile? Because presumably it could blow up. But no, they put all the evidence in this thing and fired it just so the Enterprise can chase it down with the Sarabots and 
and get it. And they also fight this big creature, which I'm not even going to get. Well, that's why I'm cause... saying it gets even more interesting. Oh. Cause yeah, all of a sudden this oh, creature just shows up this big, it's not a vegetable monster though. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they act like they know what it but is because I mean... they're, they're like, Oh, it's one of those energy dragons of Nindora. <laughs> Like, yep, <laughs> seen those before. Yep. Got to we got to do this cuz we haven't fired phasers in a little while, I guess. So, we got to fight this thing and kill it and, and then I think it's uh Dr. McCoy's Cerebot gets smashed up and Spock has to grab his head and <laughs> take him back to the Enterprise. Yeah, cuz McCoy blows up. He goes, oh. "Yeah, I'm finished, Mr. Spock. Get out of here." And Spock is very caring. He's like, hold on, doctor. Picks up his head. <laughs> oh, no, wait. But he defeats the energy dragon with his brain pattern whips. <laughs> wait, wait, no, I'm sorry. It says uh, the robot guided by Mr. Spock's brain pattern whips into a frenzy of phaser fire. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Just got to shoot at it lots. We only shot at it a little bit, but in order to defeat it, we have to shoot at it lots. Who'd have thunk? <laughs> and so Spock picks up McCoy's robot head and flies off, just like he did in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. <laughs> flies off. <laughs> and, and McCoy says, Mr. Spock, you're crazy. This hunk of scrap robot will just slow you down. I'm nothing but a pack of electronic circuits anyway. I mean, <laughs> but you're bringing his consciousness back. You're bringing his, McCoy's Katra from the robot back to the Enterprise. So stop complaining, McCoy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> so... The story, this is one interesting thing about this story, and I'll give it this, is we haven't really gotten a gold key comic story that was sophisticated enough that it's jumping back and forth between two different storylines that are going on. So I'll give it that, that it's it's ambitious. Like, you know, it's it's got two different things going on and we keep jumping back and forth. And the ending them. gets more normal I think it, now. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, but the ending is also very cliched. Right. You know, it turns out that one of the admirals that uh, was putting Kirk on trial, I, I can't even remember what his uh, motivation really was, but, you know, he was framing Kirk to for monetary gain, I guess. Meanwhile, Kirk's fro has <laughs> retreated back into his skull, <laughs> scalp and he's reverted back to kirk which is you know great yes, plastic his, his wrinkles have <laughs> reappeared <laughs> <laughs> but the admiral's holding him at gunpoint at the special effects guy's apartment but kirk gets the drop on him by lifting up the dome on this model of a water world thing that this guy did for visual effects and it's full of real water oddly enough and it splashes the guy and he goes ah and kirk gets the drop on him and exonerates himself and goes on a date with that woman from earlier, I guess. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not too <laughs> and, sure. <laughs> but uh, would yeah. she recognize him? Cause he looks different. <laughs> She's like, Oh wow. I've been asked out twice this week. Once from the captain and <laughs> once from the disco guy. <laughs> I hope they don't find out about each other. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of look alike. I wonder if they're brothers. <laughs> And this admiral or whatever oh, dude boy. that held him at gunpoint looks almost like a sleaze stack from the land of the lost. Totally. Yeah. But not exactly. green. <laughs> <laughs> no, although if you look at the uh the cover for this issue. Oh yeah. He is he green is on there. Green. And it's kind of if if you guys have seen this cover for this issue, it's really recognizable. You've probably seen this picture somewhere before. It's kind of what pops into my head when I think about the Gold Key comics. I, I've seen this cover before, and it's very. I I am so glad you mentioned that because when I saw this cover, it looked so familiar to me that I thought, "Wait, did, have we already done this one? Why does this cover look familiar to me?" So yeah, I I don't know why, but I 
You're right. I've seen this cover. This cover before. I guess it's been used for different things. I don't know. Wow. Maybe because it's well, so good. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> All of that said and done, what are your final thoughts for <laughs> these three issues in uh, Star Trek The Gold Key Archives? Okay, the, four. Fr- the first. <laughs> and yeah, this is just, this is part two. We covered the other thing. You can get a whole volume, six of these in this one volume. We split the episode up. So we've come to the last three. So. The first one we reviewed on this one was typical gold key. It pretty much was like all the others. The second one I liked a little better uh, than most of the gold keys with the kids and Kurt contemplating if he should shoot the kid or not. And so I kind of liked how that story went. Uh, This third story started off really good and just became a total train wreck afterwards. So, uh, I guess I'm going to give the whole volume in these three stories uh, three perms out of five. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good rating. Um, yeah, no, I I mean, the thing I'm finding is as we get into these later issues, they're they're taking more risks. I almost appreciate as as ridiculous and as off the rails as that story got that third one we talked about the trial of captain Kirk. It, I mean, I, I admire them for taking a little bit more risks and doing something a bit different with a storyline as crazy as it got though. It just was too much and too ridiculous. Um, the, the second one I think is probably my favorite in this, even though, you know, we certainly found flaws in it and stuff that I didn't like, but it was an interesting story and I liked, things like the character design and a little bit of the storytelling there. And the first one felt to me very typical of Star Trek gold key, but also with some interesting astronomical stuff that they were trying to work in, which I thought was cool too. So, you know, there's, there's at least one thing in each of these stories that I liked, which was, you know, kind of cool. And in this third story that we just read too, we got probably the best insult I've ever seen when McCoy calls Scotty, you oatmeal headed Scotsman. (laughs) What does that mean? I don't even get that. I'm not really sure what oatmeal headed (laughs) is, but I like it. I kind of want to use that. (laughs) Maybe not with the the Scotsman part of it, but I want to call somebody oatmeal headed. That's great. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I'm going to use that tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna give this this the entire these last three stories i'd say a three oatmeal headed scotsman out i of guess five. it's the quaker oatman right or i don't know anyway forget sure yeah that'll work <laughs> <laughs> oh so once again i you know i always want to look at this as like a yearly tradition that we dive into the gold key comics because once again they're just they're fun. I mean, this volume, I mean, these are old comics. You can get them. IDW has republished them into these volumes. You can get them electronically. So, I mean, there's, they are Star Trek stories. They feel that way, but just in this kind of silly, campy comic way. And that's what kind of makes it fun. I've, I've enjoyed these. These are like some mm-hmm. of my favorite episodes. I, I haven't laughed this much, <laughs> like, on literary treks or any podcast in quite a long time that is always one of the really fun things about doing these is you know we make fun of them and we we laugh a lot at them but that's part of the charm like i probably for as ridiculous as the story was i had more fun laughing about the trial of captain kirk than anything we've talked about on literary treks (laughs) lately so that you know for just that alone, this is definitely And worth I kind it. of feel bad at times because I think, you know, the people who wrote these, I mean, were they trying to be serious? I mean, like, I, or were they just kind of like, yeah, 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 I'll throw this in there. It'll be fun. Or I, Yeah, I don't know. It's like, I'd love, I, it, it, see, that's the thing too. They don't list who the writers are. I would love mm-hmm. to interview someone that 
was part of developing these and just see what mindset they were in. Definitely. Oh, that would be really cool. <laughs> well, it's been a lot of fun talking about gold key ridiculousness today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. But I kind of feel that darker, grittier line was the kind of thing you would hear on Entertainment Tonight, you know, to play up this new Star Trek series. Mm-hmm. It's darker and grittier. and But yeah, I heard darker and grittier all the time. And it stuck with me for a long time, thinking, oh, well, yeah, this is the darker, grittier Star Trek. Of course, when I look at it today, I don't feel that way. I feel like, well, it's it's a different take on Star Trek, but it's not what I would call dark or gritty or dystopian or anything along those lines. Earl Grey. Riker is going to stand up to the Klingon captain, you know, and saying, I'll serve on the ship as a first officer. I'll die with you in battle if I have to. But I took an oath to Starfleet that I'm not going to betray them or give up their secrets. So I cannot do that. And he gets the respect of the Klingon captain who says, well, if you'd given up the secrets, I probably would have killed you. But now you can just die with us. (laughs) The 602 Club. Really teaching these kids to take hold of life and to make it theirs the best way that they can, but in the right way. You know, get the education that they need. Treat people with respect. The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. Um, I'm glad that we got to see him and I found the interaction that he had with Stamets pretty meaningful and touching. But as far as what's actually happening, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Um, it's a little, it's it's less sciencey to me and more metaphysical. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. So check out all of these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And leave us a star rating and a written review. We'd really appreciate that. That helps people find the show. And if you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. And if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can help us out by becoming a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all of the details. Perks can include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, a Cerebot of your very own, and more. I'm just kidding about that Cerebot part. Available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce and distribute these shows each month, and we really appreciate any support you can give us. We hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all of the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. And we would love to hear your thoughts on today's show. I mean, we would really love to hear your thoughts about this stuff, (laughs) especially if you pick up these comics. Love to hear what you have to say. And there's so many ways you can do that. And the best place to join in the larger conversation is in the Babel Conference. It's our listeners group on Facebook. Just go into Facebook and type B-A-B-E-L into the search field and it should come right up. And if you'd like to send us an email... We will read it, and you can do that by using the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks, and it will come right to us. And you can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. You can also find us on our Goodreads group where we have bookshelves with all of the books we have covered in previous episodes, as well as the currently reading section so you know what's coming up for future shows. And there are, of course, always great conversations happening about all the books and comics that make up the Star Trek literary universe. Just search for Literary Treks on Goodreads and click Join Group and one of us will let you right in. 
We'd like to take this opportunity to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shemutella, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network, and specifically for being associate producers for Literary Treks. Thank you guys very much. We really honestly can't do it without you. Well, Bruce, when you're not downloading yourself into a Sarabot, even though it'll give you a headache for weeks, where can we find you? I, I hate those things. It gives me like a hangover. You can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. You can find me doing live from the edge with Brandy Jackala on Monday evenings after a new episode of Discovery premieres. That's 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So tune in and listen to that. And you can find me talking about Star Wars on the Star Wars Report. And uh, you can find that just as many places as where you would find Trek FM shows on all these apps and RSS feeds and StarWarsReport.com. And of course, I'm always in, <clears throat> I'm always in the Babel Conference, B-A-B-E-L. So find me in there too. And Dan, when you're not stuffing juicy fruit gum into the mechanics of an elevator so that you can find this young lady and have her run her fingers through your fro where can people find you <laughs> you know i'm i have to say i'm still amazed that all of that worked <laughs> that was pretty cool <laughs> but when i'm not hatching ridiculous plans using cosmetic surgery you can find me on Twitter, I'm at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, on Facebook.com slash Kurtrats Productions, and you can find me in the Babel Conference talking about Star Trek, and yeah, that's about all I do nowadays is talk about Star Trek. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. No, it certainly isn't. Well, thank you everyone for listening, and until next time... Live long... And read on. What do you call that light reading? To each his own, number one.